It's Lyndon here and thank you so much for coming to my channel. In today's video I want to take a deep dive into the chords for Autumn Leaves. This is such a fantastic tune, it's really 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 nice to play and, and what's, what's lovely about having, look at, uh, having a look and a decoding of a chord chart is this is kind of infinite. If you learn a melody on the saxophone that's fantastic and it's lovely to play but if you understand a chord chart you can literally spend the rest of your life improving the way that you interpret this chord chart and just getting better and better and better as a player and looking at constantly new things to do with it. So it's really really good fun to do and I do this with a lot of my clients with my private practice here in the UK uh, in my one-to-one -one lessons and people love it. So I want to take a deep dive into the chords for Autumn Leaves and I also uh, am just blown away with everybody's feedback and the comments and the contacts that I've made. I'm talking to people in Denmark and Norway and I'm sending the saxophone out to Lindbergh in California and someone said they're using my tutorials down in Houston in Texas. I can't believe it. It's blown my mind because I've only really been YouTubing. Well, I don't want to make it about me, but I've only been YouTubing seriously for about four months now and it's just great. So hello everybody and thank you for your feedback. And I also I also want to shout out a very special thank you to Howard Titchler who's become my first member on Buy Me A Coffee. Uh, thank you so much sir. So let's have a look at the chords for Autumn Leaves Aye! on tenor sax. Woohoo! I love my tenor so much. Right, so these four first four bars with these first four chords, how am I going to go about interpreting that? Well, if you haven't looked at my videos on major 251s, this might be a good moment. I've done a video that takes a deep dive on major 251s and it would be really good for you to have a look at that. I'll put a link in the description below because uh, what we have here is a major 251, which is a super common structure. It comes up all the time. And the way that I know that this is a major 251 is that I've got something minor seven followed by something dominant seventh or something just with a seven and then that is followed by a major scale of some sort and if I see something minor seven followed by something seven that activates my 251 alert, 251 alert and that's really important because instead of having to try and work out what D minor is, I've got flat in the third, flat in the seventh, third of D, D major is an F sharp so I've got flat, that, that's a nightmare, that's too much brain work. Now I can just Think, well that's a 2-5-1 in C which means this is the second mode of C followed by the fifth mode of C followed by the first mode of C. Woohoo! Now I don't have to think too hard I'm just going to play the notes of the family of C major and that's going to sound really 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 cool. But what I want to have a look at is this last chord here this F major. So how does that fit into the family? Um, and what you might think is, well, F major, it says F major, so just play F major, right? And you wouldn't be wrong, you know, that's a perfectly good, just regular Ionian F major. But I'm wondering if there's another connection to these other chords, right? How does this F fit into this picture? Because what we need to do is when we're looking at a chord chart, we need to look at it in context. And this is, feels rather like being a detective. Imagine that you're like a really famous detective that turns up onto a crime scene of a robbery and everybody's like look desperately looking for clues. And you just stand there and you have a look and you go, I know who's done this and the reason that you know that is because you're so experienced and these people always knock over the plants or, or they don't knock over the plants or whatever but you see some clues and the clue that we're looking for with this F major on how to interpret it is the context in which we find it. Now we've just found this F major in the context of a 2-5-1 in C and what that could mean is that this could be the fourth mode of C. Now the problem the problem with sax players, the problem that we have is that when we look at a chord we tend to think about things in terms of scales, like we want to know which scale should I play over this chord. But pianists and guitar players don't really think about 
chords in the same way that, that uh, a sax player does. They think about things in terms of the root and the third and the fifth and the seventh and maybe the ninth. They don't really, they're not so much worried about the notes in between, whereas sax players, we do think about scales a lot. And there's a good reason for that, because you can't play a chord on a sax, right? So you want to know which scale, but the, the actually the answer is there's loads of things that you could potentially play over this. But I want to keep it nice and simple and think of this as the fourth mode of C. Let me show you what I mean. So if I take a piece of paper here, if I think about F major, regular F major, F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F, and I take the root, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth, I get F, A, C, E, and G. Now, how about if I think about F as the fourth mode of C? So here's C major scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And if I take it from this point, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then I take the chord tones, F, A, C, E, and G, and it's the same, it's the same. Which is very cool, because now all four of these chords all come from the same source, which is C major. Get in, fantastic. So uh, my, my, my poor 50, seven-year-old brain, nearly 58, uh, doesn't have to work too hard, and that's got to be a good thing. So how am I going to go about interpreting these chords? Well, there's an infinite way. And by the way, that's why I love working on autumn leaves and chord charts in general, because you can learn a melody, which by the way is absolutely fine, and that's a brilliant thing to do, and I'd recommend that you do it, and I do it myself all the time. Uh, you can learn a melody, but it's kind of finite what, what you can do with it, or it's more finite. Whereas a chord chart, once you understand how to navigate your way through it, you could literally spend the rest of your life developing and listening to new ways of interpreting it and adding things in. I mean, it's just fantastic. Um, it's so, so cool. And I do this with my clients uh, for, that I teach one-to-one -one in person in the UK. And, you know, we have a lot of fun doing this. It's really, really cool. One of the ways that I would navigate my way through this is to play the chord tones, D, F, A, C, and E, and G, B, D, F, and A, and C, E, G, B, and D, and F, A, C, E, and G. That's the root, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth. And what I'm gonna do uh, in terms of an exercise is I'm going to play the root of each one, and then the root and third, and then the root third and fifth, then the root third, fifth and seventh, then root third, fifth, seventh, ninth, and then I'm gonna reverse it, and then I'm just gonna have a little jam around on those chord tones and not do anything too complex because I'm gonna to have to write the letter names out in editing and that takes four Ever. Uh, so uh, I've got my iReal Pro app, absolutely fantastic. iReal Pro people, if you're out there, if you're watching this, thank you so much. What an amazing app. Uh, and I'm going to touch on here, hopefully, and loop it. So let's do that kind of exercise that I just described. Uh-huh. 
sounds lovely, especially when I hit C nice and clean. Um, so, um, sounds really, really, really nice. So you could do this a lot. It would be a really fantastic exercise. You're hitting all the chord tones. You're practicing your improvisation. It's just, there's no downside. I definitely recommend that you practice like this. I want to explore one other way, one other of an infinite amount of ways. So this isn't the only things that you can do. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the Dorian minor over these two chords and then I'm just going to land on the uh, one of the chord tones for the C and I'm going to kind of leave this F uh, a bit empty. I'm going to leave the last bar a little bit more clear and the reason for that is that it actually sounds well it's got multiple reasons it sounds really nice to leave a bit of space it lets the listener digest what you've just said and it also gives you time to think about how you are going to approach the next four chords so there's really no downside to leaving um, a bit of space in that last chord. You don't have to, but I like to, and I think it sounds really nice. Have a listen, see what you think. So once again, I'm gonna play the Dorian minor, which is D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, through these two chords. And then over here, I'm just gonna land on a chord tone, and this I'm gonna leave more empty. And that's gonna sound really, really nice as well. So let's have a listen. sounds absolutely gorgeous. So there's a couple of ways that you can practice through these first first four chords and um, it sounds lovely and this is really effective and it's a good way to go. So I definitely recommend that you practice like that. So let's have a look at the next four bars and the next three chords. And once again, um, I've done a video on this because uh, it, this is a minor 251 and if you're not sure I'm going to put a link in the description below I've done a deeper dive into minor 251s and why and how and all of that kind of thing but what I'm uh, and and I suggest that you have a look at that um, and I know that this is a minor 251 because I've got this theta sign I've got something with this circle and a slash through it followed by a dominant seventh chord of some sort with a chord extension and that is my clue being a chord chart detective that's my clue to let me know that this is highly likely to be a minor 251 and then if I have a look at this A minor and think about the scale of A minor well B is definitely the second note of, of A minor and E is definitely the fifth note of A minor now there's a whole bunch of ways that I could navigate through a minor 251 and uh, I could, for instance, treat this, this chord here as a Locrian and in that case that would be the seventh mode of C major. And this E7 with the flat 13, that offers me loads of opportunity to play some beautiful things like altered scales or diminished scales are very popular choices and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we could do as well. Uh, and then this A minor 6 could play loads of different types of minor scales including the melodic minor would sound really really nice. But the approach that I'm going to take is a really really straightforward approach which by the way sounds gorgeous and is extremely effective and I thoroughly recommend that you practice uh, doing this uh, and I'm going to play a harmonic minor uh, through the whole thing. And which harmonic minor am I going to use? It's going to be A harmonic minor and the notes of that are A, B, C, D, E, F, G sharp and A. And that's going to sound like this. Actually, I'm going to take it up to the ninth because I love the ninth. Have a listen to how gorgeous the ninth sounds. It's just, oh, it's so beautiful. Listen.
Yeah, sounds absolutely beautiful. So if I play that over here, that's going to sound really nice. Throw that around a little bit. So, so gorgeous. I'm not doing anything complicated at all, I'm just throwing the scale around. What I would say about this harmonic minor is that a really nice trick is to start it around the E. Uh, if I do that, then I get these notes E, F, G sharp, A, B, C, D, and E. And this is actually the E7 flat 13. Also, you could write that out as E7 flat nine and this is all it is is very very simple it's just a harmonic minor it's a harmonic minor starting on an e so it's the fifth mode of a harmonic minor but it has an utterly terrifying name it's called a phrygian dominant phrygian dominant my gosh that is scary um, scares me anyway. Phrygian dominant. Ah! Uh, but all it's just a harmonic minor. So uh, if I if I play around because that, this is where the really sort of interesting notes of the scale the A the B the C the D and the E that's the same as in a Dorian minor. It's the same as in an Aeolian minor, a relative minor. That's just the same. But the the F the G sharp the A and that B, that's a kind of interesting end where you've got some more unusual notes. So I'm going to play through this again and I'm going to target starting on the E. It sounds really, really, really nice. <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. Now here's the good news. The good news is if we we're done with autumn leaves. We've finished. We've done everything that we need to. If we can take on this major 251 and a minor 251, we've got the whole tune. Can you believe it? Because look at the next part, right? This is exactly the same as this. You've got another minor 251 and then this is the same as the top part here. This is almost the same. And this is exactly the same as that. So you've done the whole tune. Woohoo! Right, let's address these chords here. So this is a minor 251. And through these chords, because I've only got six beats, I haven't got very much time to do to do anything. So when I improvise through this entire chord chart in a moment, I'm just going to play the root of each one of those. So I'm going to play the whole of Autumn Leaves now and uh, I'm going to be using these techniques. I'm either going to be using the chord tones and landing on uh, the, the chord tones of the major 251 and then resolving to a chord tone on the, on the C here, or I'm going to run up the minor scale and do the same thing. And over every single minor 251 situation, I'm just going to play the harmonic minor, but I might play this Phrygian dominant scale because I'm super complex and uh, it's going to sound lovely, right? So I'm going to do the whole thing and have a listen to how lovely it sounds. So here we go. Get myself ready.
sounds beautiful. I think I played one unexpected note in there somewhere, but we'll have a look when we go to edit. So, um, so there you go. That's the whole of the autumn leaves. Just by understanding these two fundamental structures, major two five ones and minor two five ones, you can play throughout the entire tune. It's not the most complex solo in the world that I just played, um, but it is absolutely accurate. It's functional. It sounds great. It's going to give you an opportunity to really get comfortable with these chords. And if you can do what I've just done, you can always build up your levels of complexity and substitute ideas and try out new ideas. You can build it up from there, but hopefully this is going to give you a really solid foundation. So I hope it's useful. YouTube, People, thank you so much. I, I've had messages from Denmark and from Norway and from Houston, Texas and California. And people have bought my saxophones and, and um, just sent lovely messages of, of support. Thank you so, so much. I really, really do very much appreciate uh, all of the fantastic feedback and I feel connected to all of these people throughout the world. Honestly, it's, it touches my heart. It's such a privilege um, to, to connect with people and think that um, I'm able to help people in all these different countries. Isn't YouTube amazing? If you would like to uh, help my family and me uh, and support these tutorials that I'm making, you can buy me a coffee or just send uh, a friendly message. That's, that's also fantastic. Thank you so much for watching. If there's content that you'd like to see, then do let me know because I, I listen to everything that people send me and I try to respond to comments as quickly as I possibly can as well. So thank you everybody out there. I really, really do appreciate it and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next video. So take care. Have a beautiful day. Take care. Bye.